Hello and welcome to this episode of the Geoeconomic Agenda, a podcast from the Institute for Geoeconomics at the Asia-Pacific Initiative in Tokyo that investigates the connections between economics, geopolitics, business, and society. I'm your host, Paul Netto, and I'm a visiting researcher here at the IOG. In a moment, we'll talk to Dr. Makashima Karen, a member of Japan's House of Representatives and former Minister of Digital Affairs, to talk about Japan's role in the digital economy. But first, here's the latest news in the world of geoeconomics. On Tuesday, March 28th, Japan and the United States agreed to a deal to prohibit bilateral export restrictions on minerals critical to the production of electronic vehicles. It also requires the two sides to collaborate on combating non-market policies and practices of other states in the critical minerals trade, as well as conducting investment reviews of foreign investments in their critical mineral supply chains. The agreement will enable Japanese vehicles to qualify for the EV tax credits provided in the Inflation Reduction Act, which included tax credits for EV purchases to be expanded to EVs using materials extracted and processed from countries with whom the United States has a free trade agreement, which initially excluded Japan and the European Union. Earlier this month, U.S. President Joe Biden and EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen agreed to begin negotiations on a similar agreement, along with agreeing to set up a clean energy initiatives dialogue to better coordinate clean technology subsidies in the future. Also in the world of economic security, Germany's Olaf Scholz and Japan's Kishida Fumio agreed to deepen cooperation in this space, as both countries seek to reduce their potential overdependence on China for raw materials. A joint statement from the two countries said that they will work to establish a legal framework for bilateral defense and security cooperation activities. Japan is Germany's second largest trade partner in Asia after China. Turning to negotiations, officials from the 14 member states of the Indo-Pacific Economic Partnership, or IPEF, met in Bali, Indonesia from March 15th to 19th. This was the first time that text was tabled on digital trade which will be contentious for the United States given that many progressive Democrats are opposed to internet companies being shielded from third-party liability, while the U.S.-based Coalition of Services Industries, which includes many internet companies, has called for such language to be included in IPEF as it was in the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Free Trade Agreement, or USMCA. While there were no deliverables from this round, progress was made on the trade pillar regarding text that was tabled at the Brisbane round in December 2022, specifically language on trade facilitation, agriculture, services, domestic regulation, and transparency and good regulatory practices. U.S. negotiators for the first time tabled text on Pillar 1 subtopics covering labor, environment, digital trade, and technical assistance. Progress was also made on Pillar 2, that's supply chains, and Pillar 3, which is clean economy. U.S. officials remain committed to completing an agreement on IPEF before the APEC leaders' meeting in San Francisco this November. He Lifang was formally installed as China's new chief economic decision-maker and vice premier, replacing Liu He in the role. Formerly the head of the state planning agency and described by Reuters as a confidant of Xi Jinping, with their relationship going back to their time together in Xiamen 40 years ago, According to the Brookings Institution, his rise through the bureaucracy is due to this patron-client relationship with Xi. His exact portfolio is yet to be determined, with some of his responsibilities possibly being designated to new Premier Li Chang. That's all for news. This is the Geoeconomics Agenda with Paul Netto. Today we're sitting down with Makishima Karen. She's a member of the Japanese House of Representatives representing the ruling Liberal Democratic Party. She represents the 17th district of Kanagawa, which for those of you who have visited Japan covers the very popular town of Hakone. Maybe you've been there, maybe you know it. We're talking to her today in her capacity as an expert in digital affairs among her colleagues in the Liberal Democratic Party. She's served as Minister of Digital Affairs and Minister for Digital Reform. And we're going to get her thoughts on Japan's digital policy in globalized world. So 
Dr. Makishima, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me today. So first things first, can you explain to our listeners why a digital policy is important for Japan's economy? As the matter of fact, uh, Japan is facing some challenges, uh, which include the population declining, mm-hmm. or the birth rate is uh, also getting smaller. Mm-hmm. So uh, with these populations, um, we need to have more uh, productivity. Mm-hmm. So without digitalization or uh, digital transformation, mm-hmm. uh, the productivity of Japan will decline. Mm-hmm. That's the reality we face. And also, not only the Japanese big companies, but uh, small or medium-sized companies uh, influence a lot uh, to impacts in the local communities Mm -hmm. or the job creation. So uh, we need to encourage the society as a whole or the economy uh, as a whole uh, to enjoy the benefits of the digitalization of Japan. It's interesting that you you talk about that because I think Japan's image abroad is one of a very high-tech society. Mm-hmm. People think of the high-tech districts of Akihabara or the mm-hmm. neon lights of Shibuya or Shinjuku. Mm-hmm. You know, it's very advanced, very futuristic even. So I think it might be a little surprising for a lot of our listeners who might not be familiar with Japan to hear that, you know, the country could sort of be behind in this area. So what's holding it back? When, what, what makes this such a, uh, an important challenge given international poten- uh, perceptions of Japan as a high-tech society? What, what are some of the barriers that are preventing this from happening in the first place? Um, first of all, I'd like to mention if uh, for sure Japan is behind the digitalization or not. Hmm. Uh, when comparing uh, to digitalized countries mm-hmm. like Estonia, mm. uh, we need to learn a lot from them. Uh, we have to admit that as the former minister for digital agency. But when I attended the G7 digital ministry meetings in mm. Germany last year, uh, I met with other uh, digital ministers in six countries or the representatives of these organizations and countries. Uh, we found out that we struggled uh, the same situations during the COVID-19. Mm-hmm. So how to uh, collect the data of the vaccinations of the citizens all over the countries, mm-hmm. or uh, how to uh, use the technologies at uh, classrooms mm-hmm. uh, with the uh, assistance of the experts at, uh, the, with the teachers at schools. Mm. So uh, we've shared the same challenges in G7 countries, maybe because we do have the some amount of the population Mm -hmm. and we have some advanced uh, technologies and also we have many of the stakeholders in each field. Mm -hmm. So um, to break through the uh, situations like pandemic or the COVID-19, we need to talk with uh, or we need to persuade them uh, to go through the new uh, styles of living or the new styles of uh, society with these stakeholders. So that was the common uh, challenges that we shared in G7 countries or uh, developed countries. Mm. So uh, I think it's not fair to compare Mm. with the uh, smaller uh, population countries or uh, the a very much advanced uh, digitalized countries with their historical or geopolitical reasons mm. like Estonia mm. or other European countries. So, but still uh, we have many difficulties uh, during the COVID-19 in Japan and we received uh, many uh, comments and feedback from the people of Japan or the uh, people living in Japan, uh, including uh, the foreigners living in Japan. Mm-hmm. And one voice was like, uh, why don't you or why don't the government or the local governments uh, give us the information through smartphones? Hmm. Or why uh, didn't you uh, give us the benefits or the subsidize 
of my bank accounts mm -hmm. like other countries did. But we do not have any bank accounts of the people of Japan, or uh, we do not know the cell phone numbers of the people. Mm -hmm. That's the privacy. Mm. And actually, the government itself does not know where he or she lives with whom in which city or town or village. Only the cities or towns or villages do know uh, who live there. So we have 1,741 local governments who govern the uh, people of the, their cities or towns or local governments. So yeah, we can say that was the Cyrus, but uh, that was the um, architecture of this nation or mm -hmm. this government. So uh, we had uh, difficulties to collect data mm -hmm. or uh, send the messages to the people. So mm -hmm. with more advanced DX uh, technologies with local governments, uh, we could do better. So uh, that was the reason that this agency decided to uh, organize the government cloud that all local governments can join. Mm. Regarding the things like the, the cloud and trying to get cell, uh, smartphone apps to people, you know, you have to build these things, first yes. of all. You know, you don't just go onto Amazon or whatever and buy a cloud, or I'm sorry, I should say Rakuten, use a Japanese uh, brand. You don't go onto Rakuten and buy a cloud server. You've got to develop these things, right? So, of course, in order to do that, you need to have a certain kind of innovation ecosystem mm -hmm. that can you know, create these technologies and not just create them, but commercialize them and get them out into the market so that these local communities and these local governments that you're talking about can get them to users and that everyone can feel that they're using secure, safe technology. Mm -hmm. So what, can you describe Japan's innovation ecosystem in these kinds of technologies? Is, what, what are some of the things that you're, you're seeing? I mean, you've been working on this for you know, years now, and I'm kind of curious to know, how has it moved forward? How has it changed since you got, first got started in these, mm -hmm. in these issues? Uh, relating to the government cloud, uh, this agency uh, decided which uh, cloud uh, system are the safest uh, mm -hmm. to choose. And that was the wisest uh, mean uh, for all uh, local governments because uh, it's difficult for them to decide or to choose one system from uh, many. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the role of the digital agency. And with the uh, service uh, sphere, uh, there are lots of options uh, that local governments can choose. So now this agency is preparing uh, to receiving the uh, ideas from the uh, private sectors, including mm -hmm. a huge one to the uh, startups or mm -hmm. ventures companies uh, to join and uh, deliver the ideas with the local governments. Mm -hmm. So uh, the digital agency or the government uh, is working as the platform mm. and we mm -hmm. receive the ideas and distribute them to the local governments. Mm -hmm. So that would be the smartest way, I think, and the easiest way for them uh, to choose the safest and also uh, they can get uh, the ideas, uh, the brilliant ideas from all over Japan mm. uh, with the very cost uh, effective way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You talked about the, you know, working with your colleagues at the G7, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to sort of turn back to the international mm -hmm. uh, level here. You talked about your colleagues with the G7 and you mentioned Estonia specifically. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, for people, you know, even me who just has a passing uh, understanding of these things, Estonia is probably recognized as one of the most advanced in this regard. I think they yes. have switched to a, e-government system, is that mm -hmm. correct? Where everything yes. is done electronically, there's no yes. paperwork or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Now, how do, you, how do your colleagues at the G7 and you know, beyond, um, how do you share best practices? How do you learn from each other? You talked about you know, common challenges, mm -hmm. which I think is a very good point to, mm -hmm. to bring up, but how, how do you pick up or, or 
or disseminate some of the the, the good policies that everyone's doing. Like how, how can you how can Japan learn from an, an Estonia? You know, like you said, Estonia is a very small country. Its mm -hmm. geopolitical situation mm -hmm. is quite different from Japan's. So you obviously can't go one for one. Mm -hmm. But you know, whether it's Estonia or Germany, South Korea, United States, mm -hmm. go on down the list. I would assume there's something that everyone can learn from everyone else, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. how how can Japan learn some of those international lessons and how can Japan mm -hmm. convey some of its own lessons mm -hmm. to its international colleagues? Mm -hmm. Estonia was the first country uh, I visited as Minister for Digital Agency and we treated the memorandum of uh, MOC mm -hmm. uh, with Estonia and uh, they have very keen uh, sense of the digitalization of the country or e uh, government of uh, Estonia and they have the concept of data embassy hmm. and Interesting. they understand nation as the people of the Estonia and also the data of the country. Mm -hmm. So uh, in case of emergency, they might, we do not hope that will happen, but they might lose some parts of the land. Mm. But still, they have the, all the data in other countries, so they can rebuild the nation again. Interesting. When I learned uh, the definition of the nation or a country, it was that the people or the population mm. and the diplomacy or the power of that and the land. Mm. So we need to check these three components mm -hmm. uh, to be uh, announced as a nation. But even though there is zero land, they can be nation with data. Mm. An e-nation. E-nation, so yes. Hmm. So, so much so, Estonia is digitalized and they changed the mind of the nation or the country. Hmm. So, we do not share that kind of risk management as hmm. a nation in Japan, honestly speaking. Hmm. But we face natural disasters <laughs> and we experience a lot in the history of Japan. So. We have to uh, worry about the losing the data of the people mm -hmm. or how to uh, protect the data or how to mm -hmm. protect the nation in many ways. So uh, Estonia is a very good teacher for mm -hmm. us. And when we discussed uh, with other G7 countries or like-minded countries, uh, we, I myself uh, introduced the the plans of digitalization of Japan as the analog regulations will be digitalized. Mm -hmm. uh, we are uh, planning to pass the law uh, in this uh, diet session, mm -hmm. but uh, it's going to be about uh, more than 9,000 articles mm -hmm. to be revised. So uh, during the COVID-19, we could work remotely, and but still the rules or the laws, include the local government's laws, mm -hmm. uh, ask them to be stationed there or uh, to audit it uh, mm -hmm. with the people. Mm -hmm. But we have technologies like drones or sensors or cameras or AI, and we can use them, but the rules and laws uh, prohibit them doing uh, using these technologies. So we decided to revise the rules mm. with uh, changing uh, the about 9,000 articles from the analog regulations to technologies. So that is um, one of the big challenges mm. that we face right now. And I think we can uh, share the experiences of these mm. to uh, other countries. Going back to the G7, obviously the G7 will be held in a couple months in Hiroshima. Yes. And at the G20, mm -hmm. when it was held in Osaka in 2019, mm -hmm. 
one of the initiatives that uh, former Prime Minister Abe Shinzo was able mm -hmm. to promote was the concept of data free flow with trust. Yes. So turning to the upcoming G7, how can Japan operationalize some of these concepts at the international level? Mm -hmm. um, how can it you know, promote some of these ideas about data governance and try to build on concepts like data free flow with trust? So what, what's the future for Japan's internationalization of these kinds of ideas? Mm -hmm. uh, DFFD data free flow with trust uh, is a kind of legacy of uh, late Prime Minister Abe mm -hmm. and also uh, the G7 in Germany or in UK, they mentioned the importance of DFFT. Mm -hmm. But um, this year, as the chair of G7, mm -hmm. uh, Japan should uh, propose more concrete ideas of DFFT with other G7 countries. Uh, we share it. the concept is great, mm -hmm. but how can we uh, combine our uh, concrete ideas mm -hmm. or how to work with the private sectors of all countries. Mm -hmm. So that was the agendas of this year, I think. So uh, one perspective will be starting from the industrial uh, aspect like the automobile, mm -hmm. or one will be about the uh, health issues that we share mm -hmm. uh, all over the world. And um, even uh, during the COVID-19, each country has to uh, promote some kind of vaccination record of course. system of course, yeah. or the application relating to that. And uh, this agency of Japan uh, innovated the VRS application on smartphones mm -hmm. and so many people use when they go abroad. Mm -hmm. And every country uh, makes that kind of innovation in each country, mm. which is one way all right, but uh, sometimes we need to share uh, their innovation or the innovative, uh, the roots of these applications at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And that might be easier and faster for the global trotters. Mm -hmm. So that might be one of the ways that how we can work with other countries. I see. Finally, what do you think the rest of the world can learn from Japan? You know, one of the things about Japan is that it's really been a first mover on a lot of the challenges like declining birth rate, population decline, um, stag you know, stagnant growth. Um, for a lot of the things that the world is, you know, starting to face with, Japan had to deal with these things, you know, 10, 15, 20 years earlier. So in regards to digital policy, what can what can the rest of the international community learn from Japan? What would your your message be to to people looking for lessons from this experience? I think uh, we were working uh, two concept of digitalization in Japan. Mm -hmm. One is that I already mentioned the uh, regulations from mm -hmm. analog to technologies, yes. and that will change the society of Japan and more uh, startups or ventures will join uh, in these uh, ecosystem of Japan mm -hmm. and uh, more companies will invest in these uh, young and new uh, companies relating to AI or mm -hmm. um, the drones or sensors like these. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the digital garden city nation concept that uh, Prime Minister Kishida announced. And it's not about making greener in towns. Mm -hmm. It's about making digitalized the local communities. Mm -hmm. So um, in the rural areas or like the mountainside, mm -hmm. there are old female uh, living alone uh, who have no driver's licenses mm -hmm. and have difficulties to go in shopping. Mm -hmm. That's the reality we face in many uh, local communities in Japan. Mm -hmm. And we will not leave them alone. Mm -hmm. We will give them the benefits of digitalizations. So not only in Tokyo or in big cities, but in local 
cities and towns and villages, mm. uh, they can get the necessity with drones. Mm. So, or they can use the uh, unmanned uh, automobiles mm. uh, to get to the hospitals, mm -hmm. or they can use the online uh, medication, or mm -hmm. they can receive the prescriptions wherever and whenever they need. Mm -hmm. So that's the reality of the uh, people living in there and that there are the dreams and the future pictures of them. So I think uh, there are many countries who struggle with these local communities mm -hmm. who are not well digitalized mm -hmm. and the people living there feel like they were left behind. Mm. But in Japan, we are saying we are not uh, feeling them lonely. So we will not, uh, no one will be left behind. Mm -hmm. So uh, with the DX and digitalization, uh, we can realize the concept of SDGs. No one will be left behind, even though uh, that it are a very small village mm. in Japan. Dr. Makishima Karen, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a fascinating discussion and it's a space we'll all be watching very closely. So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your experiences about this topic. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. This is the Geoeconomics Agenda with Paul Neto. Finally, in our last episode, we talked about how supply chain disruptions were having an impact on supplying ammunition to the combatants in Ukraine. This time, there's a supply chain disruption that might be hitting listeners a little closer to home, or at least if you're in the United States. Girl Scout cookies. For those of you not familiar with Girl Scout cookies, every spring, Girl Scouts, maybe ages 10 to 12, will set up booths outside shopping centers, have a school or town fundraiser, or go door-to-door -door selling cookies to raise funds for their local Girl Scout troop. Beyond just raising funds for trips or programs or supplies, the program's intended to help teach girls financial literacy, entrepreneurship, people skills, and more. And on top of that, the cookies are just really, really good, and the order forms are always a welcome sight every spring. But this year, it's a little more complicated. The cookies themselves are produced by two companies, with the majority being produced by Little Brownie Bakers based out of Louisville, Kentucky. The Washington Post reported that the company is concerned that production delays will make it harder for the Girl Scouts to meet their, meet their sales goals this year. More specifically, Kentucky, where the plant is located, has been hit with tornadoes, flooding, and heavy snow that have all disrupted production and distribution, while Russia's invasion of Ukraine has dealt a major blow to grain shipments worldwide. So if your cookie orders are taking time to process, don't buy them off eBay and cut the Girl Scouts out of the transaction, and whatever you do, don't get frustrated with the girls selling you cookies. Like so many other things, even Girl Scout cookies are susceptible to supply chain issues. And if you've never tried them before, buy a box or even seven if you can. I especially recommend the tagalongs. That's all for this episode, but stay tuned for more on the way. Until then, we want to know what you want to hear about, as well as take your questions for our show. So send us an email at geoeconomicagenda at ihj.global. Be sure to like, rate, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, tell your friends, and most of all, keep listening. Thanks for joining us, and thanks to the team at API for making this happen. We'll talk to you next time.